<laughs> so what's in the and Well, I mean the coffee. Is it on cable though? Uh, yeah, it's on cable nine on, on Access that. TV. I don't know what. Yeah, no, what you one, we've never gotten that we're too far out. Yeah, but you're not missing much. So we're moving up. <laughs> 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 we're moving up in the world. We used to be at 4 a.m. Unless you want to show it. There are other times when yeah, it's are. easier to tell you sure, the weekend, at 10. I think it's Sunday afternoon sometime or something like that. But anyway, our fan mail will probably increase <laughs> from nothing to yeah. nothing. <laughs> it will double. <laughs> double. <laughs> um, I have... Membership forms for the Ohio Poetry Association. In case anybody's interested in joining, you're a member already, aren't you? I, I you know, I think my membership has lapsed. You better give me another one of those. I don't know whether I'm a member still. I'll have to check. I was a member, but I don't know whether I'm now. Whoa! I'm just presuming that you all got making books. Yes. yes. Thank you. It was an interesting title. Um, I first encountered Nikki Fenny about who <clears throat> it's been a long time ago. She came to OU as part of that. The um, I keep wanting to call it the Appalachian Scholars, but it's not the Appalachian Scholars that we talk about now at OU, but the group of scholars in the Appalachian region that meet once a year, and it was OU's turn to have that. And she came and I heard her, and I was just mesmerized by her, partly, well, I think largely because she has a voice that explains a lot of what I didn't understand about race relations when I was growing up in Texas. And <clears throat> she's now at the University of Kentucky has been for a long time. She's head of the um, chair. She's the chair of Southern Letter, Letters and Literature. <clears throat> and I haven't heard her since then, but I've kept up with what she was. Oh, shoot, I left the books at home. She has written three books of poetry, which I intended to bring. I'm sorry, I didn't do it. Um, from, um, and she won the National Book Award in 2009 for, for the one where I was going to read something out of it. I'm sorry, it was a little crazy at my house this morning. Um, and she has, a, to me, an amazing voice that both tells about the um, distress of being black and also, she picks up the beauty of family. She came from quite a, she did not come out of poverty. Her father was a civil rights lawyer. And they insist, she has two brothers, and they insisted that she go to college. And um, so she, but she somehow, she picked up that voice. And, <coughs> She keeps, um, <coughs> The World is Round is the last um, thing that she published. And, but I have two poems for you, and, but not the one she won the National Book Award for. And it's very funny because she has a whole section on Condoleezza Rice. Oh, wow. And it's... <sighs> <laughs> was she interviewed on making, NPR? Making yeah. that, uh, no, Making is, Foots is the one. That she sent oh, us. Yeah, yeah it's the one I sent you. That yeah. is the one that is so to me. When she won that award, was she interviewed on NPR? Because yes. I think I recall. Yes. And the voice struck me too. I yeah, think I remember the, that. Her voice. Yeah. And uh, now when you say voice, you mean her speaking voice or her Poetic voice. I mean her poetic voice. I mean she has a speaking, good speaking yeah. voice. It's very nice, but her poetic voice is what I was thinking of because of the way she heard that out. Because of the way she picks up on things.
So what I wanted to do was read. I, I have a copy of this for you. The one called Charm just is out of the here. And the one on the other side is mine. <coughs> this way. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Just ignore it. The book is titled "The World Is Round." No, you have to. Oh, but this is from. Yeah, that's why. One. That's why I asked. Yeah. Did anybody find it? One, I think. Okay. Um. This one's here. It's a very different kind of a, a voice than the one about making foot. She's picked up a totally different thing here. Um. The two of them standing on the other side of the airport window, Mama rubbing her eyes and looking through her purse for anything of hers to lastly give. Daddy, hands 100 leagues deep in its salty pockets, his black pearls already secretly handed over earlier in the day. The way they stand there with nowhere else to go or be, Two watch lights watching until the last of me is all the way out of sight. Nobody waits like this anymore. Nobody loves this way anymore. Mm -hmm. She had a very close knit family. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where she got the, ch the title charm, though. Love or something else. I think she got it from the fact that she was the only girl in the family. Uh, or maybe when it says looking through her purse for anything yeah. of hers, yeah. she was looking for a charm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It could okay. be that kind of charm instead yeah. of... Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. I think it's very, it's a good point. Yeah. I enjoy it. charm in the sense of yeah. sort of putting a charm on someone. someone. To, yeah. yeah. She put it. Because I think in what I'm writing, I use the word charming. Yes. So I thought that was interesting. I, I think the last <coughs> two lines really speak to me because I went through that this year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nobody waits like this anymore. Nobody loves like this anymore. Yeah. So powerful. It is powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I will, even though maybe you've read this, I would love to read the Making Books by Nikki Finn. She, um, okay. Many of foot off an African high grass runner made into a cotton picking plowing peg was burned away into two festering runaway sores was beaten around into a southern gentleman's original club foot design. They went for our feet first, for what we needed most to get away. My papa's feet are bad. Once under roof, his shoes are always the first to go. A special size is needed to fit around ankles broken at birth. Sore feet stand on freedom lines. Weary feet stop at Southern Dust Bowl march. Simple feet wanting just the chance, just one black Gulliver jump, a crest lunch counter, or two. And do a Zulu, Watusi, zoot suited step instead of fallen arches. Wait, wait, wait for the time to come. Him wanted to put his feet up and sip some, himself some coffee, which I left out. <laughs> Papa, how's, how you say you'll take that coffee? Oh, baby, just make it black and bitter like me. My Papa's feet are bad. They beat our feet around with bullet billy clubs and by our raggedy feet had hoped to drag us all away. Country corners and city curbs is where they hold my keepsakes. Some of my brothers 
who brush their Italian skins off on the backs of steam-pressed pants legs. Shoes first, they'll tell you. Shoes above all else. They'll show you if your black foot ever wakes up in the night wanting to talk about something aching there under the cover out loud for no apparent reason. There is reason. So, I, I read this yesterday on the flight from Barcelona to London um, after an incredible experience in Catalonia and, and also as part of the uh, reaction of the Spanish government to Catalan um, claims of sovereignty. Um, this is a government, uh, a, par a political party, which is direct descendant of Franco's fascist regime. And I lived fascism as a child. And um, as I was reflecting on my experience in the trip, and then I read this poem, it really touched me very deeply. Um, I don't come from a country where um, people were beaten as the blacks were beaten in this country. But when I read these last few lines that say, aching there under the cover out loud for no apparent reason, there is reason. Uh, it speaks to me loud and clear about my own experience, and the, and the, the name of the experience is fascism. Yeah. Whether it's uh, uh, blacks against, I mean, whites against blacks in the south in the U.S. or the Franco regime and and all that, it's it's fascism. Yeah. Well, it was happening all over the south, that kind of thing. Yeah. And which I didn't much understand growing up because I wasn't, Texas was on the edge of that, although it was happening especially in the rural areas of Texas, but um, it, it has uh, really impacted my life. <laughs> I can see why. It's powerful stuff. I'd, I'd like to read some more of her stuff. She says she's got several books. I have stuff. three books which were ready for me to bring. <laughs> I will bring them next time and you all can borrow them. Do you know if they have any here in the library? You know, I don't. I could go ask. Yeah, I could check. I bet they have some. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll probably find them online. I just didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't check on the internet. Well, I apologize. My husband decided to have his class for lunch today. And it was a little bit crazy this morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> was he planning to do the cooking for this class? We've already made, we've made tortilla soup. Okay. okay. Yeah. I thought the last moment he said, I'm having a class over here. We need you to cook lunch. No, like we <laughs> did that with the weekend. So, um, so that's what I have, and hopefully Head Off and Split is the one that's got, that she won the National Book Award for, and it's very, it's especially this segment on Condoleezza Rice is hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote two poems about Condoleezza Rice, really? and I, that's what I wanted. I wanted to read that. What could, kind of take you? does she take on uh, Connelly's Could you send us a copy? Yeah. E email a copy of yeah. an attachment. I will. Thank you. Yes. What kind of take does she have on Connelly's Rice? Uh, <clears throat> it's very satirical and it's very, um, who is this? black woman, you know, parading around in her high-heeled shoes and all that stuff. So it's very <laughs> biting. Yeah, it's very biting. So. Are you going to read yours? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I did actually come up with it. If you just turn the charm one over to where it says off the window. <clears throat> Outside the window, the cypress beside the pond blaze with burnt orange. The sycamore towers over the guests assembled, effortlessly shedding its bark while surveying its realm. 
closer to the house, just beyond the scraggly branches of the recovering mimosa. The peach tree turns yellow, secretly bemoaning its barren year. The contours of the hill evoke pictures of rolling in the soft grass, delights at pond swims, fishing for catfish, and ice skating before global warming. Oh, that fall could hold off winter forever. <laughs> I think we could ice skate last winter. We could, definitely yeah. ice skate. Yeah, it's the first time the pond's frozen over in a long time. Yeah. So that's it. We used to ice skate on the Rising Park Pond in Lancaster. And when I was a kid, we would save plastic bread bags when they first came out. And we'd put a pair of socks uh -huh. on and a pair of bread bags and another pair of socks, and we'd put our feet in our ice skates. And they keep your feet warm because we'd skate all day. Oh my. So. I never tried bread bags for ice skating. <laughs> we have in between the socks. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know. I never did that. That's a very good, good <laughs> idea. Yeah. We had lots of ice skating on our pond, but I don't think anybody wore bread bags. <laughs> I actually like, wrote a poem about that one time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure, it's great. I like the peach tree turns yellow, secretly bemoaning its barren year. Yes, <laughs> bear one single peach this year. Wow. Well, I think we had a but cold snap we had a at cold. the wrong time. We had, because, yes. Because that, we my wisteria did not have any blossoms on it at all. It Next did, year, I think it's going to be blinding, but um, this year it didn't have anything. It didn't no, stop the lilacs so. weren't too good. No. Well, I mean, we had to cut the mimosa. We thought the mimosa tree had died. Um, but it turns out good. It hadn't, but we had to cut out all the dead branches. <laughs> yeah, I thought my um, beauty berry had died, but yeah, came back. More resilient than we thought. Very nice. Well, I think as long as the roots aren't killed, they yeah. still come back. Yeah. You didn't hurt the walnuts. <laughs> no, it didn't. They were very prolific. I like to think of um, a poet as a as a painter. When I'm looking out mm -hmm. at the world around me, I, mm -hmm. I will I will often use words as, like I, I will use a paintbrush mm -hmm. and you know dabble, throw out the <coughs> colors or throw out the the images in in words and. And that, that's what I'm feeling here too, is that, that sense of, a, of an artist looking out at, the, at what's around them and just dashing the paper with, with color. Thanks. That's nice. Yeah. Well, that's what I was doing. Actually, I was sitting in my study when I wrote this, and I, I had been dabbling with bits of it. But when I started to put it together, I just sat there and looked out my window and it all... Mm -hmm. There it was. There it was. Yeah. I love fall. It's probably my favorite Me too. time of year. Especially in Athens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. That's my work too. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all. Thank you. And I will bring the books. <laughs> So Tom, are you ready to be next? Sure. Uh, we're go yeah, let's start with our first, <laughs> with our newest member. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, fire. Let's see if the first page. It, it, coincidentally, I'm writing about fall also, so uh -huh. must be in the air. Must be in the air. Yes. The second oh. page. Yeah, I. You know, without knowing that you know that it doesn't do any good to try to send two pages together. No. You, you separate them and you have them all together in nice little packets and these people just take your little packets apart and <laughs> oh, won't listen to you when you say no, 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 no. Resurrecting Eden. It went all the way around the page. Oh, okay. doing it. Are you going to join us? Okay. There you go.
this is the same as the two pages. Still coming. Oh, you're going to join us. Yeah, I thought so too. You're welcome. Thank you. Resurrecting Eden. Oh, how my garden grows, once green, and now rather rich in browns and golds, a few spotted reds, against which I appear well, somewhat colorless, a value only for reflecting the setting sun that splatters its light among the shadows of an oncoming night. But where shall I go now to find the green of wealth once lived? Is there not some cash to be found in one's garden, a trove of growth and prosperity? Patterns of pleasure ebb slowly with age as the wonders of death draw near. Tis fall for me now, here in my earthly garden, with or without any radiant colors of red or gold. And what comes next? What new farce awaits me? Am I to expect some winter of discontent? or merely a pause, a passage, cold and gray though it may be. My times of youth and wealth are gone, with payments now long past due. But let me ask not where such riches may have gone, but rather from where did they arrive, those days of which I have been so blessed to partake, and from which how much have I derived? Yes, tis fall for me, but how welcome the autumn can become as my youthful garden sheds its bonnets of green, and I open to the new arrival of richer colors, carrying with them a promise to enlighten these shortened days. As with so many gardens, mine too has much left to harvest, of wealth and words and wanderings, of treatises and treasures, of ceremony and celebration, all to come. But with time, all that must go as well, as I leave my garden one screen now lying fallow, yet hardly forlorn. So here and now, in a current time, in ways more fertile than before, I wait in anticipation of a new warmth that comes with a glorious new spring. And with that new beginning to a new life, I'll till my resurrected garden, now nurtured with uniquely inspiring delights, ones meant to thrive, not perish, enrich, not impoverish, release, not clung to by a self soon to be long decayed. So grow, garden, grow, in peace and pride, passion and pleasure. Share your loving bounty with all those who need only open their hearts to receive my gifts, my compassion, my armless loving embrace. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow, you make us well, do a lot, so, so much better in this <laughs> ultimate of our lives. <laughs> yeah. That's that's wow. Beautiful. And I like the alliteration that you have. Yeah. I mean, it's not, sometimes alliteration can get to be too much. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really think. Mm -hmm. I was. Um, it's looking forward that I like. Yeah. <laughs> um, not just looking back. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that you don't have a bitterness about about the decay of our bodies. <laughs> 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 you find the reasons to be serene Oops. about it, at least, not, not happy. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, serene is a good word. <laughs> I like that armless embrace. Um, Tom, this is sort of a business thing. Are you interested in publishing your poetry? The reason I ask that if it's, you know, if Nan records you and your poems, then that's going to be a problem if you're, you want to send it in somewhere that says it can't be previously oh my God. published. Mm. Really? Even though this is uh, just access, access TV, it can sort of put print on things, so mm. you need to be aware what of that. What does that do for Jerry's book? Do it right here for me. Yeah. He, no problem. Because he was not working through, uh, right. you know, it was a, a whole different setup the way he was published. This is, right. if you're going to be print, printing something in, a, you send something to a journal and you want to have it published. If they're among their publishing requirements, it says no previous publication, mm. they can 
that doesn't mean they always will, but they can be stickers and say, well, it's been on mm -hmm. public access TV, open to the public, so uh, you just need to be, mm -hmm. I don't know if you were aware of that, or if you knew you were being filmed. <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the f I like the fact that it really speaks to life. Yeah. Life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love the illusion you know, to biblical Hebrews and you know, the original places. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Mm -hmm. Well done. Another one. Well, October. I know. <laughs> oh, it is the season. It is the season. It's been such a beautiful season. Yes. Please, oh. please. We were inspired by our trip to Hawking and Hill. We don't have any more. Any more copies? Is there another Is there another copy? Oh, there's ones of them. Morning. Hey, Hello. Hey. Oh, really? We need another chair. There's a chair over there. Do you, I, you hold that. Yeah. I'll take that. Thank you. One for the Thank you. Okay. Are you ready? It says October. You missed two previous poems. October, leaves, leaves on the trees, leaves leaving the trees, leaves all over. <laughs> acorns, acorns on the oaks, acorns leaving the oaks, acorns in excess of the trees. Walnuts, walnuts on the trees, walnuts leaving their hosts, walnuts all over. Squirrels, squirrels and chipmunks, but not enough to handle this enormous harvest. <laughs> 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 Someone told me that it was all the rain in the spring that made the, the acorns and walnuts. Do so well here. this year. <laughs> oh, no, hickory nuts. We got hickory nuts everywhere. Mm -hmm. oh, um, this is Mary Ann. This is the parking lot. This is uh, Nick Phoebe that we used to Oh, you win. And I thought, if there's something wrong with my tires, but they're all just popping away. I was running over a million acorns. Oh, they're all over the place. I'm reading a book now, which, um, interestingly enough, there, there's kind of a, a synergy that goes on, I think, and it relates a lot to your poem as well as yours, and it's called Mayflower, and whether you've seen it, it's the story of the first settlers in, um, in uh, New England. They, by the way, they didn't land in Plymouth, they landed in Cape Cod. Um, but it, it relates, a lot of it has to do, or most of the book has to do with the war between um, the English and the Native Americans that little is told about in the late 1600s and first relates to the prejudice that the English had toward the Native Americans which um, you know they the Native Americans were not savages they were working cooperatively and you see the English side of the savagery of the English um, mm -hmm. but what reminded me of it was this poem and how the Indian, the Native Americans, um, would be able to live literally in the dead of winter or fall on nuts that mm. they would find, and and they were everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so here are the English starving, trying to fight this war, and these Indians who are they're thriving. They're thriving, yes. And they're not they're not hungry at all because they know where to find. Because it's what it is an enormous harvest. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's everywhere. Uh, Can we have some of your whiskey to go with our nuts? <laughs> 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 
that's not, not unusual. I, Alfred Diamond, I know Marianne and I have read it, I think so too, uh, uh, looks about the decline of civilization. Yeah. I, I, has pointed out the irony that some people die of starvation in the midst of plenty because they have a cultural taboo against eating fish or eating nuts or beans or grubs or how crazy we are. Cicadas. Cicadas. Yes, I saw that in Zimbabwe. Well, they were eating a lot of things. Not the last time, but the time before that when we had the, the periodical cicadas. Uh, and they were all over the place. And the African students, many of them, were delighted with them because they would toast them, roast them, and uh, and you know it's oh, it's, it's pure like protein. The chips. There, there are no there aren't any bones in there to deal with because they have you know their cells are on the outside. <laughs> My dog loved loose. them. I didn't eat any. <laughs> well, the British came in and told the Zimbabweans that it was savage and not appropriate for them to be eating cicadas and other things like that. And so they totally screwed up their diet. They got biscuits, which are mm. cookies. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy. protein for sugar, right? That's protein of, for sugar. Yeah. yeah. Did you um, while you were I, I did. You did? I'm amazed. You've been oh. traveling. Yesterday. I knew that was <laughs> Oh my. I'm surprised he's here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you we threatened are. not to be. I, uh, well, as I was uh, telling our friends, I, I, didn't, I didn't think I would be able to come. I arrived 10 hours ago, 11 hours ago. Oh my God. But jet lag said, get up and go. <laughs> so, for me now, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's the right time to have a little sherry, so would everybody please? <laughs> 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 okay. By the way, this uh, Thursday at 7, I will be giving a presentation here in the library on Catalonia. It's history, it's culture, right. and it's claims for sovereignty and what's happening today um, right there. And I just came back and I was fully immersed in the process and working out with the Catalan government as uh, a consultant on, on a few issues. And uh, uh, it was very intense, it was just a fabulous, incredible trip. But the last two days, um, first I went to Girona, which is uh, an old, old town founded by the Romans 2,200 years ago. And the downtown is full of buildings built in the 9th, 10th, 11th, some of the newer ones, the 12th centuries, the 13th centuries, really more than ones built in the 14th century. Um, lots of Romantic and Gothic um, architecture. My nephew lives there, and I wanted Adriana to see one of the most magical towns in Catalonia. And then on Sunday, um, a friend of ours picked us up on, 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 on Saturday, Saturday evening. We went to his uh, house, a uh, small town where he has his, uh, his own um, house outside the city. He lives in Barcelona. And um, wanted us to um, uh, have the grand tour of uh, Dali's Museum in Figueras, which is down where he was born and created one of the world's most amazing museums, because what's even more interesting than Dali's art inside the museum is the museum itself, which was built in a surrealist style and just amazing. And then after that, um, he wanted us to go to Cadaqués, which is an incredible port in, on the coast, and then to Porto de Gat, which is um, what inspired me to write this poem, which I wrote yesterday on the plane from, <laughs> from, from London to, to New York. <laughs> So, uh, any strange thing about this, obviously, is because of that, but the thing about Port Ligat, it's a very small town, and um, Dali fell in love with it. And as a young man, he went and built and, and, and bought a fisherman's shack, which he expanded and finished, and then bought the next shack and did the same thing, and then the next one, and eventually he has this amazing labyrinthic um, crazy construction, built completely in the surrealist style with um, desiccated bears and lions and... The clocks that melted and stuff like that. Clocks that melted, <laughs> you, know, I mean, you name it. Um, water that falls the wrong way and uh, right on the, um, uh, on the little bay uh, called Port Ligat. Port is the same thing as in English. And Ligat means tide and it's because it's a little cove of a bay that the, as you enter the bay, you think it's a lake because it's almost completely enclosed, and there is a tiny little 
um, outlet that goes into the Mediterranean Sea. And um, one reason why, well, this is the easternmost point on the Iberian Peninsula, very close to the French border. And Dali um, loved the town because he said, I'm the first person on the Iberian Peninsula to see the rising sun. <laughs> and in fact, uh, he had um, uh, quite an amazing bedroom, quite amazing. <laughs> and from the bed, um, uh, he, uh, he could see the sun because the, 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 it was the wrong place, wrong position uh, of the bed to see the sun um, through the window. So uh, the, the, the next room, he had a 45 degree angle, uh, a mirror and a 45 degree angle, so from the bed would just raise the head and see the rising sun. And he felt very happy and ready for the next day. <laughs> What's most interesting for me though, more interesting than the house, is the land around it, which is, um, it's hills that long, long ago became terraces, and now they grow uh, grapes, and they make excellent wine, and, but mostly they grow olive trees. Mm. And, um, and my grandfather had olive trees, and um, so uh, that um, inspired me to write these, the olive trees of Port Ligat. The ancient terraces transformed the coastal hills. Centuries of loving labor, one generation after another, changed the steep hillsides into flat gardens that retained rainfall and rich Catalan soil. Stones from the same hills, cut like elongated bricks, become retaining walls. The slopes that used to fall fast into the plains and the sea have become stacked balconies, harmonious and comforting, where olive trees now grow. Olive trees live longer than empires. Their fruit has nurtured Mediterranean folk since time immemorial. I walk around the trees as others walk in a temple, in silence even if friends are near, thinking of history and identity, feeling the presence of the rough but loving hands of farmers who planted the trees decades or centuries ago, but still alive in the robust trees and their youngest descendants now tending the land and the trees just like their forebears did in Roman times. The ground, the ground under the trees offers the fruit not collected by the olive pickers, glistening under the warm sun of an October afternoon. I bend down and pick this black olive. Oh my God. <laughs> I contemplate the hard olive now in the palm of my hand. I know that my family tree has farmers that collected black olives ages ago and marveled at the miracle of fruit and seed. I am here now in the autumn of my life, grateful to the land of my birth and peace with myself. Juan, the five-year-old son of my friend, runs toward me, full of life and excitement. He has seen a small butterfly and wants me to help him follow it in its flight. The dreams of the farmers who love their families and their land, build the terraces and planted the trees, is alive in the clear eyes of this happy child who takes my hand and wants to follow a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. This is the skinniest tongue you've ever heard. <laughs> 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 it was a tight uh, joke, uh, economy class seat, so <laughs> there was no problem. <laughs> uh, maybe that was a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> she's right poems in a plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is the long poems, and one way to get this one long is to make it narrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it could be all just one one line. And <laughs> that, that mirror inspired you to change them. You can look at the sunrise with a mirror. You know. <laughs> that was a great picture. It's beautiful. Uh, as Dolly inspired me to, we made a work picture. It's very vivid. I think this is more coherent than many of the Dolly. Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> I can feel you in here, Joe. I mean, really, this is that you're, you're, it's interesting that you would bring 
No, because yeah. at just about the time I was thinking I'm really Joe is really lost in here. He shows the eye. <laughs> I was there. I have the evidence. Are you sure that didn't come from a jar? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You I'm can kidding. touch it. It's really hard. I'm teasing. <laughs> if you bite into it, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. Yes. Did you claim it at the? Uh, that's what customs? I was wondering. What about <laughs> customs? Oh. How did because you, you brought it into the book. Yeah. I did. I, I didn't. <laughs> I did not. We'll never tell. <laughs> Please don't. In any case, a, a very dear friend of mine, we were in, a, in an old Roman town where I, I was invited to give a speech. And um, uh, that town is famous for its um, cured meats. And uh, he just saw the, 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 the typical story in town and, and bought this long, oh, okay. Okay. whatever it's called. I don't know. Long and inside. Uh, and um, and I thought, well, I'll take it home for about two weeks because I just got it to need it. And I was stupid enough, to be honest, and clear the customs, so of course it was taken away and, and destroyed at JFK. Oh. 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 Yeah. And I thought, hey, here's the price you pay for being honest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I uh, took a yoga workshop last year from Angela Farmer, who has an island in the Mediterranean. And, and, uh, she was really talking about the olive trees, and now she's in her mid seventies and still moves like a twenty year old. <laughs> and she's talk, but she talks about the olive trees, how you know they bend and twist, and how the body does. You're that. supposed to get old, and she's yeah. you're supposed to take the first, the two top pages. You didn't pass oh. that on. You passed it's on. Okay, we did it. Okay, because I we I, did it. I okay. didn't get one. Because she only had uh, one. That's why I said it. Marianne. There we go. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You are prolific today. Well, when we went to Greece last, we went during the season, and people couldn't understand. I mean, people thought we were coming to pick the olives because it's not a tourist time at all. But. We learned how all the picking goes. Um, you know, I do want to say, I was recently talking to a Welsh friend of mine whose name is Laura, mm -hmm. capital L, small L, O R A. And this Liggett, Port Liggett is that double L, too. Yes. It's a very Welsh kind of thing. Are you aware of that? I no, no. I, I mean, I've seen Welsh words with a double L, but I didn't pay attention. But to that. it's it's a very different pronunciation. Yeah, because uh, it's in Spanish, it's oh, thank you. almost like a Y, isn't it? So like, well, it's um, it's different. Uh, the yeah. uh, the Spanish pronunciation. Well, it depends on what part of the Spanish-speaking world. Mm -hmm. In Argentina, it's more like a G, mm -hmm. and in in Mexico, it's it's really a Y. Yeah. Um, in Catalan, the double L sounds like the uh, French GL or the Italian IL. Mm -hmm. It has a U sound, like uh, this would be Ligat. It's, it's very difficult for uh, non-Catalan speakers or non-French or non-Italian to pronounce that, that, that particular sound. Because the Welsh double L is, is like, Llewellyn is Llewellyn. Okay, oh. it really is sort of... No, that's very different. Back of your throat. Very different. Yeah, and you know the, that there's a town called Heimlochlin, which is. Hmm. Do you have some Welsh in you, Patricia? No. Well, I might. Oh, okay. I'm, Welsh, I'm, I'm, I might. <laughs> um, but I, I've been to Wales. To Wales. And you know I'm sort of language oriented, and so yeah. And when I was in Wales, I was had to keep calling someone to back in London find out when our flight was leaving. And I'd use a, a phone kiosk, and the operator would say, what's the name of the town you're calling from? And I'd say, ah, I'll spell it for you. <laughs> you think I'm going to pronounce it? You've got new thing coming. <laughs> the, Did he laugh? She, yes. She, OK. And when I would spell it, she'd say, well, I don't know how to pronounce it either, because she was a Brit. She wasn't Welsh. <sighs> Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yada, 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 yada. <laughs> I'm not listening. <laughs> <laughs> I was in such a mood last night. If 
you ever stood at the top of the falls hoping to be airlifted to safety before you died a brutal death, giving up butter is nothing. <laughs> it's more like grabbing the offered life preserver that will keep your sorry ass from sinking titanically from self-inflicted internal distress. <laughs> but what do first world people know? Most think it's all just about taste. The richer the flavor, the better the quality, the more divine, the stronger the race. Until they run straight from the table to the porcelain throne and their tongue tongue talks rubbish in sarcastic, painful undertones. As above, so below, the saying goes we all know, even doctors will deny any food body connection. It's just so much confection. Right, except the heart disease rate actually fell when meat was scarce. Wartime can be good for something besides death. Less fat, plus less meat equal longer life, if not shot or gassed. <laughs> Hate to tell you, lady, but vegans are without doubt obnoxious people who love, love to flaunt. And not everyone's goal is long life, especially when it's filled with no fried chicken strife. <laughs> oh, right. You think only of what you can't eat. There's not one thought about what makes the body feel best. Stop being stupid, you're flunking the test. Fine, just go and get that coronary bypass and forget about the rest. You can get one up or two or even three, but it's a promise, death will move more quickly. To those who pr proudly insist and fast food prove it daily, a vegetable is something they can always resist. <laughs> <laughs> So they had fun writing this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't see that. <laughs> right. And then it reminded me of an old poem that I had once read here, but I, I had it in, you know, handwritten stage, and I remember Sven saying to me, you should check that up. So it has the same cheekiness to it. Good to see you. Rumor has it you're getting married, the Chinese fortune said. You're headed for a domestic bliss with your daughter-like but unrelatedness. <laughs> I know you're getting old, but hey, everything still works and that boozy young thing likes you in her bed. Even if she really only wants your baby, of course I fear she'll ditch you. Then you'll have to gin up a monthly sum, and that's not a maybe. Still, I wish you both well. Do I sound like a pill? You have my blessing. Go at it with vigor. You might need to take one yourself when it's not just about will. Hell no, I'm not available as a sitter. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody in particular? <laughs> yes. Oh, I think it even has a social security number. Well, this, this poem is kind of entitled A Sense of Place, uh, and I hasten to say that the voice of the poem is not necessarily the same as the voice of the poet, that <laughs> this is not necessarily me. Uh, it, it makes a reference, an allusion to a poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes that I want to briefly remind you of. It's a famous poem, and I think many of you will remember it from school. It's called The Chambered Nautilus. And so he talks about how wonderful the, the Nautilus is with its chambers. And, and then he says that that gives him a great life lesson that, uh, that nature has given him by the creation of this marvelous pearl uh, animal of the sea. And it ends with this rousing uh, last stanza that goes, Build me more stately mansions, O my soul, as the swift seasons roll. 
leave thy low vaulted past. Let each new temple, nobler than the last, shut thee from heaven with a dome more vast, till thou at length art free, leaving thy, thine outgrown shell by life's unresting sea. I love that. I love it too. Yeah, she just quoted it. <laughs> you know what he's talking about. The chambered nautilus builds a little house mm -hmm. for itself and then it outgrows it, so it seals up that one and builds another one, and it's a beautiful pearl shell. It's a wonderful yeah. thing. Cool. Uh, anyway, I, I make reference to this in one, so I, to avoid a footnote that Patricia <laughs> would have to. I, I noticed that Joe had a footnote. Joe, well, he's an and academic. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Are you going to start footnoting all your poems? That seems to be a professorial thing. No. Sven does it to his sometimes. Okay, so this is a sense of place. <laughs> For 44 years I have lived in this old house. The wife I adored helped me raise four fine kids here. We renovated and added on to the place many times. Slowly we turned a cold house into our warm home. Our children are grown now, they're on their own, and my wife died a decade ago, leaving me alone. Suddenly, this old, dear old place seems too big for me. I rattle around in its too many empty, ghostly spaces. This now is no suitable abode for a lone old man. Like a hermit crab, I sense a need for a new shell. I am the spent soul in the chamber of Nautilus. It's time to leave my beloved but outgrown home. So that, that is an old man. That could be me, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not leaving. But, but it isn't, actually. I'm very happy in my house, and I have no intention of, of, of leaving my shell behind yet. But, um, so then, in spite of the many references to your personal life, this is not about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I deny it. <laughs> or it was the most melancholy me not that you're yeah. me. That I woke up this morning. I, I don't identify with this guy. It seems to me we've heard this be. disclaimer before. <laughs> <laughs> I think that he protested too much. <laughs> anyway, that's my that's contribution. Lovely. Thank you. That's lovely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, we outgrow each day, don't we? I mean, yeah, we, 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 we somehow go through that change on a regular basis. So this could be... Um, you know, looked at in a very small way of saying we, we just outgrow each day sure. and see a new one. Well, if, if I look back on my life in a, in a literal sense, not the, uh, the poetic sense, uh, we do act like hermit crabs. We go from well, one rental place to another, from one shell to another, uh, usually because we acquire family and kids are getting it bigger than the last one, each new mansion no more than the last to, to do the whole thing. And then there comes a time when you have to leave the shell and uh, go on to whatever is coming after the Garden of Eden. So. <laughs> no, they're coming from the other side. The Bandelier National Monument, New Mexico. <clears throat> Ancient rocks, porous, rough to touch. Tell me your secrets, the ones you hold of the ancients. The ones who lived by ceremonial kivas. Work the land, ground corn, the ones who lived before and supported each other in ways unknown to us today. What secrets do you hold of the lovers and the brothers and the sisters, the sons and the daughters, that only this old land, the cliffs, the canyon, and you know? Wind floats through the canyons, playing haunting, low flute tones, overhead a sky so blue, so cloudless, sun shines on ancient cliff-dwelling abodes. In silence and imagination, I see laughing brown children, women grinding corn, men talking of the next hunt. Hard to believe on this holy ground, Los Alamos is only a few miles away. What would the ancients think? How would they ponder what was done so close? Maybe it's good they are gone. <laughs> I meant to 
bring what, what is ceremonial kibas? Well, kibas, well, that's kind of what I called them, and I had a brochure I meant to bring too. Has anybody been there? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, kivas were like, uh, I guess, circular holes in the ground, and they actually went there for decision making meetings, mm -hmm. and they didn't separate church and state and everything sort of like a oneness and they would go to look where they found these beans, the Anasazi beans which had been there for I don't know how long they were supposed to be no more of them and some somebody found more and that's now why we have Anasazi beans again. You're kidding. And I you were talking about the, the book you're reading and how the British, or maybe more than one of you were speaking to that subject. Um, when I toured the uh, Palace of the Governors in Santa Fe, um, we had a, a docent who took us around and talked about the history of New Mexico. And one of the things he mentioned was that they, when the Spaniards came, they were different uh, with the Native Americans than the than the uh, Brits were, the English people, they were more um, there to, uh, you know, as a pastoral type uh, priest and wanted to convert, you know, but they weren't as like angry and and uh, warring as going. She was not leaving much behind just an ordinary history with too much kowtowing and self-effacement. Had she really expected to see her misspent life flash before her eyes? Now she lies on cotton sheets, a cocoon curled into itself inside this benevolent holding cell mesmerized by the soft click of an overhead fan. The sound whispers she is still alive. During the split second when she is siphoned away with no warning, will she ken why the sound has stopped?